Hey, welcome to 49cc Scoot. My name's Brent, and this is my 2004 Vento Triton R4 Chinese scooter that's been sitting in the corner collecting dust for the last 11 years. It's actually my first scooter that I bought brand new from a local dealer about 20 years ago. I rode it for a few thousand miles stock before adding an MRP performance pack that included a big bore kit, exhaust, intake, reeds, carburetor, and CVT upgrade. The OKO carburetor that the performance pack came with did not stick around for long because the stock carb worked just fine for me and was easier to tune. But otherwise, I rode it like that for thousands of miles more. Eventually, I wanted to try a bigger CC build, so I had the original cases machined to accept a 45mm stroker crank, and I cut them myself so a 54mm cylinder would fit, and that was the first 103cc that I built from a 49cc. Scooters were already an obsession for me by that point, so I rode it and tinkered with it for a while, but I had others, and this one that I call T1 found its way into the corner of the garage. Now let's fast forward 11 years to the present, and its brother, T2, another 2004 Vento Triton that I stripped down to the frame and used as a test bed for my experiments and just tons of miles, has been eating expensive pistons and cylinder kits in its RC1 power plant after I decided to switch to a 34mm flat slide carburetor. Well, it didn't last long. That led to the idea of having a backup two-stroke that I could ride without spending every waking minute thinking about how it could be faster. Now, that doesn't mean that I want it to be stock. Not a chance. I just don't want to spend all of my time and money on it once it's running again, so the plan was to get it going in a form that would be much quicker than stock, but still relatively reliable. Before I got the RC1 for T2, I had an 86cc top performance liquid cooled setup in another set of 49cc cases. And it ran just fine when I pulled it out of T2 about two and a half years ago, so it seemed like the perfect candidate for T1's resurrection. Already having the scoot and the engine, I hoped that I could do this without spending much money. So I started out by sourcing what I felt comfortable with from AliExpress, eBay, and Amazon. But of course, I wanted some top quality components as well, so I looked to my friends at ScooterTuning.ca for those. If you need parts for your build, you should check out Scooter Tuning as well. They've got replacement parts, performance parts, styling upgrades, tools, and pretty much anything you'd need to make your dream scooter. They're in Canada, but don't let that fool you. Parts are delivered more quickly than most places that I deal with here in the US and at lower shipping rates and orders over $200 ship for free. All right, now it's time to get to work. The first thing that I did was install a battery and make sure the electrical system was basically functional. That all checked out, so I moved on with the goal of getting radiators for the liquid-cooled engine to fit. Initially, I was thinking that I might be able to hide the radiators in the front fairings, but I definitely needed to make more room. This scoot is a couple of inches lower than stock from a shorter rear shock and sliding the front shocks up in the steering step. The problem with doing the front that way is that the tops of the shocks stick up and move with the steering, so it leaves less room for anything else nearby, but there's another way to accomplish the same thing without the overhang by shortening the forks. I started by measuring how much I lowered it initially, 2 and 3 8 inches. I put the scoot on a stool and strapped it down so it wouldn't fall off and remove the shocks. I drained and disassembled the forks one at a time. The idea is to use a spacer on the damper rod to shorten the shock. The spring is removed and then a spacer slides on and the spring goes back on. Whatever length the spacer is reduces the height of the tube sticking out of the fork slider, which is basically the body of the fork, and therefore reduces the overall length of the fork. Spacers should not be tight on the rod, so most of the time you can find aluminum or steel tube or pipe that will work without much effort. Just make sure to cut the ends as straight as you can and make both spacers as close as possible to the same length so the fork lengths are the same. From what I've seen, most people suggest cutting the same length off of your fork spring that you added with the spacer. So in my case, I used a two inch spacer 
so I should cut off two inches from the spring. Spoiler alert, I found it to be way too soft that way. So for anyone else thinking about doing this, I would suggest cutting no more than half of the length of the spacer off of the spring. You can always put it together, test it, and then cut off more if you need to. Once that's done, the fork can be reassembled, refilled with fork oil, and reinstalled. Here you can see the difference in the shortened fork on the right versus the repositioned one on the left. After that, I moved on to trying to mount the radiators that I bought intended for 1994 to 2002 Kawasaki KX125 or 250. I only needed the inner mounts on one side of each radiator, so I covered the fins with cardboard to protect them and went to work cutting and grinding the unwanted bits off to save space and for cleaner appearance. Unfortunately, I realized that there wasn't nearly enough room to hide the radiators the way I'd like to in the front, so I went to work trying to mount them behind the leg shield, beginning by welding a couple of M6 threaded mounts that I made to the frame so I'd have good spots to bolt a bracket on. Then I started making a bracket out of 8 inch thick, 1 inch wide steel flat bar. I made aluminum adapters so I could easily bolt the radiators to the bracket. There are mounts made with rubber to reduce the vibration, but I have similar radiators on T2 and I found that they moved too much using rubber because the radiators were intended to have support from the other original brackets as well. Aluminum adapters have been used on that scooter for six years now without issue. Next I had to figure out where each radiator would sit and try to get the bracket to put them there. The job was made more complicated because the leg shield on this scooter is asymmetrical, so each one needed to be positioned a little bit different. Once the bottom section was done, I made a top piece. I added vertical bracing as well, leaving the center open so the VIN code could be accessed easily if ever needed. I have a pair of neon yellow powder coated wheels that I really like and I wanted to use for this build. And I got a 220mm RPM brake disc and caliper to go on the front. So I got that mounted while waiting on the radiator brackets paint to cure. The wheels are stock Triton wheels, so they should use stock spacing, but I'm not going to use a cable-driven speedometer, so I disassembled the original speedo puck and pressed the center spacer out before installing the front wheel. Then I started trying to mount the four-piston caliper with a bracket for a Yamaha Zuma that was supposed to have the same spacing as my forks had. Supposed to fit or not, I could not get the holes to align. I used Zuma brackets on T2 without issue, so I think I may have got a flawed part. But whatever the case may be, grinding away some of the raised section allowed it to fit. I bolted the caliper on using a couple of spacers that I made. The RPM 220mm kit on T2 needs spacers to work with a larger disc, so I assumed that this one would need the same and made a couple myself when I realized the kit didn't come with them. I then turned my attention to side to side alignment of the caliper with the disc, finding that the caliper needed to move closer to the wheel. 
I tried a few different washers before finding a couple that roughly centered the caliper around the disc. At that point, I realized that the caliper was sitting way too far outward and wouldn't make much contact with the disc, so I removed the spacers that I made. It looks like this bracket was actually intended for a 220mm disc, so it fit much better without them. I swapped the old standard lever out for a cheap aftermarket part left over from T2, put on a new hose, and bled the brake. I finished up with the old trick of tying the lever down overnight to leave me with a nice firm lever feel the next day. By then, the bracket was dry enough that I could put the radiators on temporarily so I could mark for holes where the hoses would pass through the floorboard. I planned to use 5 8 of an inch heater hose with an outside diameter around 1 inch, so I drilled inch and a quarter holes and used valve cover grommets that work for a 1 inch inside diameter to protect the hose. Later, I marked and cut holes in the leg shield to let some air pass through to the radiators. I was trying to cut the holes small enough to maintain the integrity of the panel, but large enough to provide sufficient cooling for the radiators, but I figured I could always cut the holes larger later if needed. I picked up a Polini coolant overflow reservoir and made a bracket so it could mount above the radiators. Most of the time the reservoir should do nothing, which is probably why some don't even bother with anything more than a hose routed toward the ground. I don't normally see any coolant in there, but if I do or if the reservoir becomes pressurized, then it has always been an indicator of a head sealing issue, so I like to use one to prevent coolant spills in that instance and to warn me that there's a problem. I'm going to wrap this episode up here, but be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the rest of T1's comeback or any of my other projects. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching.